mercy and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a limited time offer. Act now. Operators are standing by. When you hear those words, you know what you're hearing, don't you? Under what setting would you hear those sentences spoken? A sales pitch, right? Probably some sort of TV infomercial. And the idea here, it's well known and yet many people still fall for it. The idea here is to create some artificial form of time pressure to force people to make a decision quickly because everybody knows decisions made quickly tend to be a little less wise than the decisions on which we take our time. There's a name for it in marketing studies called artificial scarcity. And we know when we hear about artificial scarcity, we're being given a sales pitch. The internet has adapted very quickly, as it tends to, to adjust to and incorporate this sort of deal. That's why there are so many sites that have lightning deals, or daily specials, or a little countdown clock till this deal is gonna run out. It's to create that pressure, oh, I have to decide now. And of course, hopefully force us into a bad decision to purchase something which we otherwise would not. And therefore, it's understandable that we might shy away from these sorts of tactics. That when we hear statements that sound like this limited time offer, we respond with a certain amount of skepticism, a certain amount of doubt or frustration. But, what about those times that what is best for us really is limited? in terms of the time during which it can be received. For instance, what about when there are medical treatments that really do need to be administered within a certain window to have their best chance of working? What about when there are financial practices or financial investments that really do need to take place within a certain period of time to be most effective? What about those times? When we really do need to convince others or be convinced, now really is the time to act. That's what's going on in today's passage from 2 Corinthians. Paul is making an appeal to the Corinthians for an offer which he knows has limited shelf life. He knows it's a limited time offer, and if they do not act while the offer is available, well, it's not going to be available forever. Take a look at the appeal that he makes in verse chapter 1, chapter 6, verse 1. Paul writes, working together with him, which is Christ, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Paul is asking them, that word appeal could even be translated as beg, or to try to persuade. We appeal to you. He's trying to convince them, much like a sales pitch often does. He's making his appeal, and his appeal is that they would not receive God's grace in vain. There are actually two things very important that are tucked into that statement. The first thing, make no mistake, God's grace is offered to all people. It's important that we understand that. God's grace is offered to all people. Let me give you a couple of verses, because you shouldn't just take my word for it. For instance, in 2 Peter, Peter reassures the believers in the New Testament times that the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God wants His grace to be applied to every human. He wants all to come to repentance. He does not wish that any should perish. And this, by the way, has always been true. Look in the Old Testament, all the way back to Ezekiel, and let's be honest, there are some really dire, unpleasant words spoken through the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel. But in chapter 33, 11, Ezekiel spoke to the people. As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but desire that the wicked turn from his way and live. See, it's always been true that God desires for all people to be saved, for all people to receive his grace. And Hebrews chapter 7, back in the New Testament, makes it plain, Jesus did this once for all. 
We use that phrase once and for all pretty frequently, but in this case, it's a very specific usage. Jesus did this once for all when he offered up himself. Make no mistake, God's grace is offered to all. God does not desire for any to perish, but desires for all to come to repentance through the gift that he's given in Jesus Christ on the cross. But also make no mistake, Paul is making his appeal that we would not receive the grace of God in vain, which means that God's grace is not received by all. There's an asymmetry here, and it's important that we understand it. His grace is offered, poured out to all, but it is not received by all. Why is that? At great length, in one of our Lutheran confessions, the formula of Concord takes this up, but this sentence is an important one. It says, and we believe and teach and confess this, the reason some are not saved is as follows. They do not listen to God's word at all, but willfully despise it or plug their ears or harden their hearts. Jesus talked about this in a parable where a poor man died and went to heaven and a rich man died and went to hell. And we're never entirely sure why one goes one direction and one goes the other. But one of them makes an appeal. The one who is in hell makes an appeal that one would be sent from heaven to warn his brothers about this. And the response is, Abraham is speaking here, not sure why Jesus picked that, but Abraham says, your brothers have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And the man in hell responds, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. Which is, of course, exactly what Jesus did, and yet there still are some that do not receive God's grace. Not because it's not offered to them, but because they are not willing to accept that word which God has given. And thus Paul makes his appeal. We understand God's grace is offered to all people, but that does not mean that all people are saved because some reject that offer. So Paul makes his appeal to the Corinthians and through them to us that we would not receive the grace of God in vain. In fact, it's even a little bit more urgent than that. Look, if you wish, on the back of your bulletin. Look at verse 2. He gives a quote from, from the Psalms in a favorable time. I listened to you in a day of salvation. I've helped you. He says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, there is a limited time offer. It's not always going to be open. It's not always going to be available. Now this sounds harsh. Like I said, when we hear that, you know, act now, limited time offer, we feel like we're being sold something. And if God is eternal, and God is all loving, isn't this just some divine form of artificial scarcity? I mean, couldn't God save anybody anytime that he wishes? Why would it be a limited time offer? Isn't God just being harsh or capricious? No. Anytime it seems like God is being mean, I encourage you to think it through and see if God isn't just describing reality, and it's the reality itself that's harsh. Think about it. The offer is limited. Before there was sin, before our forefather and foremother, Adam and Eve, fell into sin, there was no need for salvation. So we do have a time period when the need for salvation began. And after Christ returns to call all believers home with him, there will be no further chance, Scripture teaches us, for salvation. And so by definition, it's an offer that has a beginning, and it's an offer that has an end. And therefore, it is a limited time offer. We do need to act now, because as Paul points out, now is the day of salvation. Now it's important that we really reflect on that reality. That that reality really sink into our hearts. Think into, sink into how we understand life on this side of eternity. There should be some urgency to our belief. Some passion. Some eagerness to share that same belief. I don't know if any of you are familiar, I hope you are, because they're pretty fun to watch, with the Magic Act, Penn and Teller. Ever, ever watch them? Well, one of them, I think it's Penn, because Teller doesn't say anything, so it must be Penn. 
Penn is a pretty outspoken atheist. But he said something, and I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but it really struck me. He said, what I really can't stand is Christians who don't evangelize. That's not what you're used to hearing. That's not what you expect. He said, I really can't stand Christians who don't evangelize. He says, because you can bet, and I'm going to edit his language a little bit here, um, but he says, you can bet, if I believed with all my heart you were about to get hit by a bus, I would do everything possible, including tackling you, to get you out of the way. If you believe I'm going to hell, you should be doing everything possible to prevent that outcome. He said, I don't believe Christians are right, but who I really don't have any patience for is Christians who believe I'm going to hell and don't feel any urgency on the topic. That's interesting, isn't it? Not a perspective we expect to hear. But then when we consider, I looked up some statistics so that these would be right up to date. Uh, sociologists, ethnologists, they've studied the world, they've determined that there are, by basis of language and where they live, about 16,000 distinct people groups in the world. It means their own culture, their own language, that sort of thing. Did you know that fully 4,000 of those people groups have no gospel at all? No missionary, no pastor, the Bible has not been translated into their own language, they have no access to the message of Christ whatsoever. And that doesn't even, uh, by the way, that 16, that 4,000 people groups, that adds up to 180 million people living on earth today who even if they wanted to read a Bible, couldn't. And of course that doesn't count all of the people who have Bibles gathering dust on their shelves with full access to them and yet are not opening them. And so Paul makes his appeal to the Romans, quoting from a different book. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And so you realize this really is a limited time offer. And that we are called, those who know this to be true, to be those who deliver this offer to others. It's not promised success. There's some wonderful passages in Ezekiel about the lack of success that he faced and the frustrations that come with it. But if we truly believe this message, it should create in us a certain amount of urgency. Fortunately, Paul then answers a very practical question. Well, how? You say, okay, I really do believe this. And when I hear about and think about the outcome for so many people, some of whom are my loved ones and some of whom I've never even met, I really do want to do what I can to spread that message, but how? Fortunately, Paul already thought of that and spoke to it. For instance, in verses 4 and 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, actually I'll start with 3, he says, We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God... We commend ourselves in every way. All right, that sounds good. I'm willing to do that. Sign me up. And then look at what he lists. By great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. And if you know the book of Acts, he's not exaggerating. He had personally gone through every single one of those things that he lists. Unfortunately, if we wish to carry this message forth into the earth, how does this happen? Well, first, sorry, but it's true, it happens with endurance. It happens with patience in the midst of suffering. How we as Christians bear our crosses is the very first thing that Paul points to in terms of how we give our testimony. And this goes contrary to pretty much anything you're going to hear if you turn on a television preacher. We like to believe the message, and I think that's part of why it's preached so frequently, that the more faithfully we are, the more happy we're going to be. The more faithful we are, the less we're going to suffer. The easier our lives will be. But that belief is not scriptural. We had in the gospel the example of the storm. Going out on the boat was Jesus' idea to begin with. We have plenty of people in the Bible who are personal biblical examples. But you know what? We always look at the clearest example. The cross. No one has ever been more perfect, more loving, kind, or wise. And Jesus endured absolutely the worst that this 
had to suffer, and in doing so, conquered it. The first thing, if we are urgent, as Paul urges us to be about our belief, if we truly do believe that now is the time of salvation, then the first thing Paul tells us to get ready for is a certain amount of endurance, a certain amount of suffering. But that's not all. He then continues in verses 6 and 7 with what's sort of a shorter list of what he later develops as the fruits of the Spirit. He says, by purity and knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. It's not just how we behave when things are bad. It's how we behave all the time. You've probably heard it before, but it's worth passing on. I love it. The definition of character is what you do when nobody's looking. And that's kind of Paul's point here. If we are to bear testimony about who Christ is, and if we believe that it's a limited time offer, then we should expect a certain amount of suffering, but we should also seek to bear these fruits in all circumstances through the Holy Spirit that we've been given. And then he points out that this is going to happen, if you read the first half of verse 8, both in honor and dishonor, through slander and through praise. And by the way, both of those are temptation. Whether we are being honored and praised, or slandered and dishonored. You know, it's funny, if you study a fair bit of, of human history, you'll see there really are two things that make people go off the rails. Bad things and good things. Sometimes, in the midst of bad things, we compromise or we take shortcuts. But sometimes, in the midst of good things, we're too willing to, to believe, I did this. We're too willing to believe that we are truly a cut above. It's interesting to see that Paul points out that he has to strive to be faithful both in honor and dishonor, both in praise and in slander. And this is possible, the endurance, the fruits of the Spirit, no matter the heights nor the depths, only when we rely on realities that are unseen. He says in verses 8b and following, we're treated as imposters, and yet we're true. Treated as unknown, and yet we are well known. Treated as dying, and behold, we live. As punished, yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. This reality, this life of testimony, is only possible when we know that the truth lies beyond what we're able to see and perceive. And what others are able to see and perceive. And so first, we live a testimony with our lives to this limited time offer. That grace is offered to all people. But the warning that not all will be saved for some reject. The testimony of our lives is the very first thing that Paul talks about. But it's not the only thing that he talks about. And I love verses 11 through 13. He says, we've spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. What a wonderful description of vulnerability and yet generosity. He says, you're not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. And so in return, I speak to you as children, widen your hearts also. Open up. And that happens with words as well. Receive in love and care all who come down the path, not because we believe that all who come down the path are following the right path, because some truly and clearly reject God's word, but because we know that whoever is before us is one who is beloved by God. Whoever we encounter in our life, it's one who has been offered Christ's grace, forgiveness of sins, and life everlasting through his death on if they would just believe. And we know that it's one who perhaps has rejected that offer. And so Paul encourages us to live lives that give testimony to the certainty we have, for this offer is limited, but to widen our hearts. And so that's my prayer, not only for myself, but for all of you, that that would describe us, that we would know there's some urgency here. This is a limited time offer. But as the Holy Spirit works through us, we'd endure in the midst of hardship. We'd bear the fruits of the Spirit, no matter whether things are good or bad. And that our hearts would be widened in love, offering ourselves to all who are in need. It is, indeed, 
a limited time offer. Now is the day of salvation, and you are Jesus' sales pitch. And so I pray that by his Spirit he will give you the strength and the love and the words to carry this message to all whom you encounter. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.